start the recording there now. Okay, now. I'm just going to try and share my screen. So, Annette, um, if you can hear me, that's great. Uh, as I said, I'm going to keep everyone on mute for the moment. Um, so you won't be able to talk to me at this stage, but we'll, we'll and then when questions come, we'll do that later on. Uh, so. Okay. So you hopefully all see the um, little slideshow that I've started up on the screen there now. Um, and I'll, yeah, I'll try and have a look at the chat box as we go along. All right. So, welcome everybody. Thank you for, for attending tonight. Um, yeah, it's absolutely fantastic turnout. And uh, yeah, I think it just shows, you know, the huge impact that, that osteoporosis and osteopenia and low bone density has on our community. Um, there's obviously a, a huge host of people who are affected by this condition. Um, and it can affect all ages, obviously, particularly women, uh, but also men. So yeah, it's fantastic to have you all here and I hope you uh, enjoy tonight's presentation. Um, now, so as I said, we're gonna be focusing on osteoporosis, but also exercise and, and how that can be used um, to manage osteoporosis. Um, just having a look here. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, uh, and then we'll get going from there. So, here we go, all right. So about me, I'm a bit of a, a bit of a wild one. This is a, an image of me uh, throwing myself off some rocks. I like to, I like to test my, my bone density uh, myself quite regularly, as a lot of my clients will know, uh, when I turn up on a Monday or Tuesday with scratches and scrapes in all sorts of different areas. But look, I, um, I studied at the Sydney University, um, Bachelor of Applied Science in Physiotherapy. And graduated in 2012, so I've been doing this job now for eight years, which is which is flown by. But um, and as I said there, I'll oh, just a bit of a plug for myself. I, honors class one, um, I graduated with. I I did my dissertation in chronic pain and, and neural sensitization. So how our nervous system um, can become sensitized to pain and mm -hmm. and and enhance or or prolong the effects of pain on people as well, which um is very relevant and we deal with this all the time in the clinic. Um, as I said, I have a broad experience in private practice, physiotherapy, sports and, and musculoskeletal physiotherapy, um, uh, predominantly. And as I said, I, my main passion here uh, in, my, in the work that I do is, is with exercise. I, I enjoy exercise a lot myself and I'm really passionate about how powerful exercise can be for treating uh, all manner of, of of uh, physical problems and, and mental problems as well. Mental health uh, is, is a big part of what we do as physios um, in trying to support our patients through difficult um, periods in their lives and, and getting back to what they want to do with their activities. So this is something that I'm really passionate about and that's dovetailed perfectly with doing more work with, with osteoporosis and osteopenia in that there's a, just a huge wealth of evidence that we'll talk about tonight in how exercise can help those conditions as well. Um, and as I said, yeah, I'm a bit crazy, so <laughs> hopefully that doesn't work against me in the long run. Okay, so uh, as you know, I, I work at St. Leonard's Physiotherapy, um, and I suppose most of you will be familiar with our services and, and our premises, uh, some of you maybe not as much. Um, so just in a nutshell, <laughs> sorry, I'm just going to, just, if everyone can just keep their things on mute, it'll just help us keep uh, the noise levels down. So if you can just throw yourselves on mute there. Um, that's great, thanks. So uh, yeah, so we're, we do a lot of work in all sorts of areas. Uh, most relevant to, to what we're talking about tonight is chronic disease, osteoporosis, diabetes. We're working a lot with patients with these conditions at the moment and, and osteoarthritis. Um, musculoskeletal physio is the bread and butter of what we do. So treating all manner of back pain, neck pain, headaches, Fortune injuries, you know, the whole gamut from head to toe. Um, we do also have a broad spectrum of specialties. So from pediatrics all the way through to elderly care and, and, and treating patients in their, in their homes, 
who's coming to uh, our physiotherapist, Sally Hodge, does a lot, and Elizabeth Rose. Um, and then our sports physiotherapy, which has sort of taken off a lot more in recent years with the North Sydney Bears. Um, and Peter Sharp, our principal, is heavily involved there, along with um, myself, Michael, Chris, and, and Josh as well, particularly. Um, and as I said, so we, we have an expert team. We, you know, I think really work well together as a team. Um, we have a collaborative approach with all of our patients, and some patients will see multiple practitioners if that's uh, necessary. Um, and so, you know, we, we provide a fantastic service. And as you'll know soon enough, we have a huge new premises under construction. Well, it's sort of an extension of our St. Leonard's area uh, clinic, which is going to include uh, a purpose-built built gym for uh, chronic disease management. So that's where the Enero program will be heading most likely in, in 2021. So let's get stuck into the stuff. So what are we going to cover tonight? Well, we're going to talk about uh, osteoporosis. What is it? What causes it? Who does it impact? Um, we're going to talk about how it's typically managed, both from a medical point of view, which obviously is not my area of speciality, but it's something that I, I know a little bit about, um, but also then how it's then managed with exercise and, and what's the best way to do that, uh, and a presentation of the research around that area. So osteoporosis, it's a huge impact on our community. Um, so if we just take the sort of numbers here, like 1.2 million people in Australia estimated to be affected by osteoporosis, which is, uh, you know, a, a bone density that is under a, a score of minus 2.5, which we'll talk about later on. Um, and then a further 6.3 million with osteopenia. Um, and so osteopenia being between normal bone density and osteoporotic bone density. So some consider it a, a pre-osteoporosis type um, state for the bones to be in. Um, and so, you know, all in all, we're looking at a huge chunk of our population of, of roughly 25 million people affected by this, these conditions. Uh, it's estimated that 66% of people over 50 years have osteopenia. And, and this is something that's a little bit sometimes controversial in that, uh, as you'll see, as we talk more about diagnoses of these conditions, it's normal for our bones to decline in density over the lifespan. And so as we get older, it's much more likely our bone density will be low. Um, compared to our peak bone mass that we reach in our early 20s. So osteopenia is not necessarily a pathological state. It's, um, it's something that can be quite normal in the, in the process of aging. So we have to always be very careful in how we diagnose and then also um, you know, manage these problems and, and whether or not they are a problem or not for some people is, is something to be discussed. Affects women more than men. Uh, and then as you can see there, the costs are quite large. So if you fracture your neck of femur, you're looking at a, you know, a $27,000 medical bill. Obviously, the public health system will cover a large chunk of that, but that's a huge cost on our community and our, and our system. Um, and so, and it, again, fractured neck of femur or hip fracture is something that is generally considered the most uh, significant adverse event from an osteoporotic uh, background. And as you can see there, 50% of people with a fractured neck of femur may never return to their previous living in, in a home. Um, and so there's a loss of quality of life and potentially even death from something like this. So it's a significant risk and something that should be looked at closely and mitigated. Now, just to give a brief background on bone and, and you know, what is bone and, and what is the anatomy of the bone and, what, and what's the relevant things to know here. So, as you can see in this image, uh, we have, well, this is your femur, so the long bone of your thigh, the strongest bone in your body. But the key things to point out uh, on this image is that bone has two primary structures that compromise the physical nature of the bone. That is the cortical bone. So I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but um, the cortical bone is the thick or, or sometimes not so thick outer layer of bone um, that you would typically, if you were to just look at a bone, you're looking at the cortex of the bone. It's only when you then cut into the bone, so this sort of cross-sectional area up here, uh, where you can then get a, a view of the trabecular bone. So the trabecular bone, in here it's been labelled spongy bone. It's not particularly spongy uh, in, in its physical characteristic, but 
the trabecular bone it represents it's a bit more of like Swiss cheese, like a, a porous look, something, something, like, something like a pumice stone. And that's within the bone structure. And on the outside, you have the cortical bone. Uh, the cortical bone is much more comprised of like our calcium deposits, our mineral deposits to make it very strong and stiff um, and provide you know, this, the structure of our body. Um, but the trabecular bone being that spongy bone inside has a higher collagen content and collagen is like a more flexible material. So it has more of the ability to bend or absorb forces before it ultimately fails. Um, so as you can see here, trabecular bone can withstand a higher strain. So 30% um, of, of, of load before it starts to fail compared to only 2% for cortical bone. Um, other things to note in this image are the blood supply to the bone uh, supplies the cortical bone only, and the trabecular bone is supplied by the uh, bone marrow, which sort of diffuses the nutrients into the bone. Um, now, bone is anisotropic. So what that means is it's stronger in different directions depending on the way that it's loaded. So uh, I suppose the way to think of this is if you try to, if you take a piece of A4 paper, for example, and you try to uh, squeeze the paper from a, in a compression sense, it won't break. It, it, you can't cause any damage really to the paper in that sense. But then if you do provide a shearing force and, and tear the paper, you can rip it in half quite easily. So the, the strength of this A4 piece of paper is dependent on the loading direction that you apply to it. And that's the same for bone. So bone can withstand a compression force. Um, so something like, for example, if just squeezing a bone physically, or uh, if you jump and land and provide force straight down from sort of top, bottom and top of the bone, um, those types of forces, it can withstand quite well. Tension, so, you know, pulling along the length of the bone um, or tension from say, lifting a weight, so this is something that we talk about later on is if you hold a weight at the end of your arm, the force of that weight is providing a sort of downward tension along the surface of the bone. And then a shearing force is less likely to withstand. So a shearing force would occur most likely when you have a fall or get hit from the side very suddenly. And so these are the classic ways you break bone, you fall onto your wrist or onto your hand and, and then there's a a momentary compression, but also a shearing force across the bone. Um, and same sort of thing, if you get hit with a, a, a you know, heavy mallet or something from the side of your leg, it's gonna shear across the, the bone and it, it can't withstand these forces as well. Um, and as we said here, the trabecular structure, so that the structure of that spongy bone, the actual way it's comprised and the way the, the lines of bone line up in relation to the forces being applied, can be arguably more important than actual density of the bone in total. So this is important when we talk about osteoporosis, osteopenia and fracture risk and, and what actual variables are relevant. Um, as you said, guys, if you think of any questions as you go along, because I'm, I feel like I'm, you know, just commanding the, the room, but um, just chuck them in the chat box or keep them for later and we'll, we'll open it up. So osteoporosis, well, what is actually osteoporosis? It's a reduced bone mass. It's less bone, there's less mineral content in the bone. Um, Calcium is the big one that, that forms up bone, but other um, minerals in our body, magnesium, phosphorus, also provide structure to the bone. And, and osteoporosis is essentially a reduction in this mass, which as I said, happens naturally over time, but osteoporosis is a condition where that bone mass is reduced significantly and has become highly more vulnerable to fracture or breaking. Um, so you'll see in this image here, healthy bone, the trabecular bone is porous, but quite um, prominent in the healthy bone. In the osteoporotic bone, there's larger gaps and the trabecular bone does not have as much density or structure. Um, and so, as I said, this trabecular bone, the spongy bone inside is what tends to be reduced first. And it's only late stage osteoporosis where the cortical bone starts to um, also break down. Uh, and so as I said, osteoporosis leads to increased risks of fractures, vertebral fractures, wedge fractures, fractured hips, 
And the, the gold standard for diagnosing osteoporosis or the way it's defined in the literature and in, and in medical terms is a T-score on a BMD or DEXA scan of minus 2.5 or below. Uh, and this is actually, we're talking specifically here about the femoral neck. So the particular area of the body, that's the gold standard definition, but the definition has been sort of used clinically uh, in relation to the spine and also other parts of the femur or hip. So any T-score below that in any part of the body does ring alarm bells. But it, it typically, to define osteoporosis, it's, it's in the femoral neck. Uh, and we'll talk more about this in a moment. So again, loss of mineral content at a higher rate than it can be replaced. So without going into too much detail, we have cells that build bone and cells that break down bone. And it's a balance between these two cells that ultimately defines whether the bone increases in its volume or decreases in its volume. And so osteoblasts build bone, osteoclasts uh, break down bone. And this is a normal process of re regeneration that occurs. But when the osteoblasts get outweighed by the osteoclasts, then we have a problem. We start to lose bone mass. Um, the pathophysiology of um, osteoporosis, so what actually causes the problem, because we, we've defined the problem, but what actually causes it is very complex. So it's not one single cause. Um, there's a few things going on. Most commonly hormones, which support the osteoblastic function for the building of the bones, but actually inhibiting the osteoclastic cells um, are reduced especially post-menopause for women. And so if, if we're losing hormones in our bloodstream, like estrogen, then we will potentially have a problem. Low calcium levels in the body will also contribute, and, and vitamin D levels um, could contribute to a loss of bone. And this can happen just by way of diet, um, but also because of reduced absorption in the gut. And, and this could be other things like celiac disease, which is mentioned there below, um, and other problems in the gut that mean that you're not getting these calciums or nutrients in your body. Um, and other things that also occur, for example, use of corticosteroids for treatment of, of various health conditions um, can lead to a breakdown in the metabolism of calcium and vitamin D in the body. And that can then have a subsequent effect on bone. As you can see, there's multiple levels here and it doesn't, it's not just a simple cause. Thyroid function, uh, particularly hyperthyroidism, is, uh, is going to have a potential increase uh, effect on bone as well. And if your hypothyroidism is, is there, but you're being treated for that, sometimes the medication will push you to hyperthyroidism and that can also then cause a loss of bone. Uh, again, there's a lot of risk factors here and um, you may or may not be aware of the BRAX uh, tool, which is used by generally by your doctor or your endocrinologist to calculate fracture risk. And you might, um, I, I'll probably send out some follow-up information from this, um, from this seminar so that you can investigate that further. Um, so, but basically the, that tool is a tool that you can put in all your details, your weight, your height, your T-score, your BMD scores, then from your scans and then some other risk factors that then collates a number to calculate your uh, fracture risk in the future. And this often happens also when you go to have your bone mineral density scans done as well, they, they take these details. But things that put your risk, your age, the older you are, the more likely you are to have a problem with your bone density. Females more than males, family history. Again, if simply if you have a family history of it, then you're more likely to have it yourself. Uh, low calcium or vitamin D, corticosteroid usage, as we spoke about that, um, commonly used for rheumatic conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, um, you know, even post-cancer uh, treatment and things like that. Low hormone levels. And again, the big one here is early menopause for women or, or post-menopause. Um, thyroid conditions, conditions are impacting the, the gut, rheumatoid arthritis uh, as well. Again, mainly because of the subsequent use of corticosteroids or lack of exercise uh, and things like that. Chronic liver and kidney disease, again, affecting your absorption of nutrients and, and things like that. Um, medications have some effect. Ethnicity, the Asian and Caucasian people are more susceptible than um, uh, you know, darker skinned and other, and other ethnic um, origin people. 
um, and then also lifestyle factors. Now, this is the big one on today's talk, I suppose, is that you know the lifestyle factors of physical activity um, and then weight and obesity, you know, impacting on your hormonal hormonal function, but particularly physical activity. These things are going to have a big contribution over your lifespan to your your bone density. So uh, just quickly, again, being that women are the most affected uh, demographic by this condition, just we should just talk about that uh, briefly. So um, again, we have, um, oh, so sorry, Lynn, I think just asked what is ETO. ETO is just the medical abbreviation for alcohol. So alcohol consumption uh, is, again, excessive alcohol consumption can be linked to uh, changes or, or lower bone density. So that's what that is there. Um, and yeah, well, I'll address these other questions as we go along. So peak bone mass for women and men reaches around the age of 20. So you're building bone in your early decades of life. Uh, and that's happening due to just, you know, the growing, um, the process of growing. And then also exercise around this time, uh, exercise levels will help to stimulate that bone growth. So often your activity levels in your first two decades uh, from a physical point of view will, will have a contribution to your peak bone mass. Once you reach peak bone mass, it's unfortunately a bit of a slide down from there. That's the case for everybody. Um, I think men tend to reach their peak bone mass a little bit later than women. Uh, but overall, women will tend to have a lower bone mass on average, even just at that start point. So because of that, they're then more likely to reach the levels that are considered to be osteoporotic. Um, and after the age of 50, and again, more so post-menopause for women, the loss of bone can be about 2% a year. It's normally roughly 0 0.5 0 .5 to, to 1 0.2 or so percent per year loss uh, each year from that peak bone mass, but that rate rises up significantly uh, post-menopause for women. And that's again, why it's a huge risk factor. Uh, in women, it's that loss of the osteoblastic support function of estrogen. Um, and the osteoclast activity will outweigh osteoblast and therefore you lose bone. So, to diagnose um, bone mineral density issues, we won't go too in depth with this because uh, you know, I think it's probably a little bit um, over information in some ways, but the, the, the T-score minus one to minus 2.4 is considered osteopenia. And then minus 2.5 and lower is considered osteoporosis. The T-score is a statistical measurement. It's a standard deviation away from your peak bone mass uh, which as I said here if you so if you look at this little chart here this little colored chart um, this is if you see at the bottom it's the age and years so 20 is where the measurement starts and this blue area is the, the middle is the average and then the upper limits of the average and the lower limits of the average uh, bone mineral density at that age and as you can see, it's a sort of a slow decline down, but the blue is tracking, this blue space is where the average person would sit. As you can see, when they get to around the age of 80 uh, in this particular graph, and this is all based on um, ethnicity and, and gender and things like that, but um, they start to reach that minus one T-score level, which is measured here. So they're reaching osteopenic level naturally, even, at an elevated age. So it's, it's not necessarily abnormal for that to happen. Um, but then this plot, which is the person in question here being measured, they're at the age of about 58 and their T-score is sitting down at about minus two and it's well outside that average range. And so they're two standard deviations down away from, um, you know, their uh, peak bone mass. And so therefore it's considered osteopenia in this case. Uh, so you can see that here, minus 2.2. So this is osteopenic. Um, as you can see here, they've had a previous scan and their baseline ch or the change since their baseline percent per year is only 0 0.6. So they're, they're losing bone at a relatively normal pace, but clearly their overall bone mass is low. So there's something going wrong here um, we need to address. And the Z-score, which you'll read, is the comparison to your age matched. 
So that gives you more of an idea of where you sit compared to people of your age. So that, that gives you more of an idea of, well, is this normal for my age or is this abnormal for my age? And the T-score just gives us a, a, an overall measure. Uh, as I said here, hip mineral density is a stronger indicator of um, osteoporosis than, uh, than the spine uh, due to the number of factors, but we'll, we can talk about that later on. This is your TBS score again. This just is a measurement of the actual uh, trabecular bone, which we talked about, the structure inside the bone, which actually tends to be lost earlier than the cortical bone in osteoporosis, but also contributes a lot more to the overall strength of the bone. And this is a new measure or relatively new measure that's come in uh, to supplement just, this, just the overall bone mineral density scores. And again, in this case, the person is sitting quite low on the scale. So this again tells us that not only do they have low bone density, but their actual trabecular bone score, which is kind of measuring their structure of their bone and how well it lines up with those force um, lines and, and how it could withstand force is also poor. So this would mean this person has a, a fairly high risk of fracture compared to if this number was up here, higher into the average range, so that, but still if they had low bone density, but this number was up higher, it would mean that even though the bone density is low, the actual structure of the bone is quite robust and so it can withstand fracture uh, more easily. Uh, someone's asked, do you need to get a different type of scan to get a TBS? Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's, it's part of a standard bone mineral density measurement at certain locations. I think certain machines will, pr will provide this score. Um, and some will not at this point in time. So I'll, I'll, I'll need to double check on that. But yeah, it doesn't seem, it doesn't come as standard with every scan that I see. Uh, so I believe it is probably a different machines will have it, but I don't think it's something that has to be referred for separately by a GP or endocrinologist. It's just purely if that uh, place where you have your scan done has the, the equipment to do so. Uh, but it's definitely worth having um, as an additional supplement to what we do with uh, bone mineral density scans. All right, as I said here, 60% of variation in bone fragility is related to the actual mineral density. And so uh, the score of this can actually give us more information as to how robust that structure is in the bone. Okay, again, medical management. Uh, I won't go on too long about this because again, you know, it's not my area of expertise and um, something to discuss with your GP or endocrinologist. But basically, medications are often the first line of management for someone who's diagnosed with osteoporosis or who has had a low trauma fracture. So we're talking about a compression fracture in the spine from minimal trauma or, or even uh, maybe a fall in a fracture that wasn't uh, particularly high force. And so if you've had a fracture and then you've got osteoporosis, they'll tend to look at options of medication. Uh, we have prolia injections, so twice yearly injections, this is a monoclonal antibody. We have bisphosphonates, uh, both monoclonal antibodies, prolia and bisphosphonates such as Fosfamax Actinel, uh, designed to suppress the function of the osteoclasts, to suppress the function of the bone breaking down cells so that the bone building cells have uh, sort of tipped the balance in their favor, um, so to speak. Hormone replacement therapy is uh, another common treatment and again, more relevant postmenopause for women uh, and with hormone dysfunctions. Now, but there's a, there's a risk here of um, the high risk of cardiac issues, stroke and, and, and heart attack and things like that with HRT. So it's often not prescribed in older clientele, but uh, so over the age of 60, but um, or, or 70, but you know, younger people, uh, 50 years will often have this thing on board. Um, Teriparatide is often reserved for people who fail to see improvement with other forms of treatment and have very low bone mass and maybe and have had one or two fractures. Um, there's different considerations on the PBS, but this one builds bone. It actually builds the osteoblast function, but there's a, another risk here of um, osteosarcomas and, and, and overbuild of bone and, and, and tumors and things like that. Medical management also involves vitamin D and calcium supplements. Um, which I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with. Nutrition advice. 
and then you know inverted commas weight bearing exercise and so what is this weight bearing exercise this is the golden question you're all here to know about and, and i'm going to tell you uh, but basically you know often in the past i suppose this has been a very non-specific prescription you know okay go and do some weight bearing exercise go and do some walking go lift a few weights oh okay off you go um, and there's no real you know um, structure to that to that diagnosis or uh, that prescription uh, and often there's been an excessive amount of caution in people with low to very low bone mass in that we don't want to cause a break in the bone so the sort of historical situation has been don't go lifting heavy that's that's not good enough maybe go and do some low impact lower impact exercise like walking but don't go do a heavy lifting because you might break your bones so there's been this sort of turning away from heavy weight bearing exercise because of the perceived risk of a fracture from that, or maybe even a fall from doing exercise that would then ultimately lead to a potential fracture. Now, uh, medication can be quite effective, five to 15% improvement in bone mineral density over a sort of one to four year period. Uh, and then a subsequent reduction in your fracture risk. So bone mineral density is one thing, but you could have very low bone mass and never have a fall or trauma that actually leads to fracture. So there's a couple of different factors here. Anyway, the medication can build bone and can reduce your fracture risk. But as your most of you will be aware who have used some of these medications, the compliance is poor due to side effects. And, and there's lots of different side effects that can affect people. Um, yeah, so uh, someone's asked about nutrition advice. So this is, yeah, probably not in the realms of what we're gonna talk about much today in that, um, uh, basically it's not my area of expertise specifically. And as far as, um, as far as I'm aware, you know, it's, it's really going to come down to the individual person's, um, medical situation as to what nutrition advice is best because there's multiple facets there. Um, so we won't be talking too much about that. Hopefully that's not a problem for you guys. Uh, now, as we said, there's poor compliance due to these side effects with medication. And there's also quite notably here, a 40% non-response rate to medical management. So, you know, give or take 40% of people will use these medications and not necessarily see a increase or, or a significant change in their bone density. Uh, so, and, and that can be because of poor compliance as well. But this is ultimately overall not a great number in that, you know, you're not necessarily going to definitely see advantages to taking that medication. What about exercise? How can it come into the, the, the picture? So exercise has always had the potential to be great. There's minimal side effects. So everyone has had an injury from time to time or, or some pain from exercise, but the actual documented side effects of exercise, the negative side effects of exercise are very, very low. So you've got maybe an acute cardiovascular event, like a heart attack, is one in 1.5 to 36.5 million training hours. So you take a group of people, it take that many hours of training on average before you see a heart attack occur uh, as, a, as a result of the exercise that you're doing. So there's a very, very um, low chance of, uh, of, a, of a cardiovascular event or, or musculoskeletal injury. Um, and again, generally speaking, GPs, have not been had a, a huge amount of training in exercise prescription, don't necessarily think that it's going to be effective if people aren't adhering to it. So there's also the, the evidence in the past for in the, in the case of osteoporosis, the, the evidence that we've had uh, up until say 2012 before the, the lift more trial, which we're going to talk about was a very modest impact on bone. So a 1.5% improvement in bone uh, mass after doing an exercise program for 12 months, um, you know, which was part of the osteocytes trial was considered quite modest on its impact. And so medication seemed more effective. Therefore, exercise hasn't always been on the agenda. Um, now, the reason why exercise has potential, as uh, we'll get to, is that the bone, and we know this from animal studies and from studying the tissues in, in vitro in a lab, or in, yeah, in vitro in a lab, is that bone requires high strain and strain rates to respond. Um, so you need to put a certain amount of force through that bone for it to create an effect that is osteogenic. 
in that it then stimulates your body to build more bone. Um, so but the other thing that was quite promising in animal studies is that after a certain amount of repetitions of, of strain, there wasn't a, a necessary proportionate increase in the in the response of the bone. So 36 repetitions of, of, a, of a, um, a stimulus seem to be just as effective as up to 1800. What this tells us is that we don't need to have to do too much work to get the response we want. Uh, but overall, higher loads and lower repetitions seem to be superior to lower loads and higher repetitions. So a low load of higher repetition activity is walking. Small amount of impact on each step. You can do it for hours, uh, but is that effective for your bone? Or do we need to go much higher load, but do it less often? Uh, that is the question. And then that's what we found to be effective as well. Uh, and so if we just think about that, if I just bring back the, the, the idea of the bone, I don't know if you can see my little screen anywhere, but um, if you think of bone as a, uh, you know, a tissue that wants to respond to load, and as we said, if you strain the bone in a certain way, um, it will then put it in a state that's uh, straining enough to create a response. And so we're trying to find that happy place between loading it heavily, but not overloading it to cause, um, cause fracture. And so what's the evidence? So as I said, the osteosize trial, which was done um, in 2012, this was a 12 months randomized controlled trial uh, involved men and women over the age of 60 years. The exercise they did was three times per week and 60 minutes per session. So relatively a good frequency, longer duration session, uh, but it was resistance training that was moderate in its impact. So we basically talking about tw 12 repetition max weights. Uh, and that means that a weight that you can lift about 12 times before you reach some sort of fatigue. Um, and there was no, not much impact exercise. There was balance, there was education involved. And so this is in a gym-based environment doing machine weights and dumbbell weights. Uh, and then what was found is that compared to a control group, yes, there was an improvement in bone, but it was modest, 1.5%. Uh, but there was a reduction in fracture risk. And so if we just talk briefly about that, so your fracture risk is gonna be, comes down to your bone density, but then the other side of that is how balanced you are, how strong you are, you know, how, how well can you withstand a fall or, or a load on your body through your muscles, distributing that force through your muscles and how well can you, um, you know, avoid falling in the first place, which is often comes down to balance. The exercise clearly can improve your balance and your strength. So it can reduce your fracture risk, even if it doesn't improve your bone density numbers on a scan. So th this study showed that there was a, a decent reduction in fracture risk comparable with medication. Um, you know, and so you can avoid the side effects of medication, let's say. There was soft tissue injuries in this study, uh, quite a lot in fact. And the part of that was that it wasn't always fully supervised. And so sometimes people got things wrong and, and caused some soft tissue injury. Now, the Live More trial. This is the trial that was done uh, a bit more recently. And, and as you can see, the results were released in 2017. And this is what forms the basis of the a Nero uh, program, which, which is what we are running at um, St. Louis Physiotherapy, what I'm running at the moment. So the Live More trial, what, where were the big differences? It was eight months compared to 12 months of the osteosized trial. Postmenopausal women, so this is the, the group that was looked at, two times per week, 30 minutes per session, uh, so not a high amount of frequency there, so short sessions, two times a week, but the major difference here was that the intensity of the resistance training was much higher, so we're talking about 85% of a one rep max, or, or this is about five rep max, it's the types of weights you can only lift five times before you, five to seven times before you're reaching some sort of fatigue. It takes time to build up to that, but that was the ultimate target to, to lift that those heavier weights, but to do it in a safe and highly supervised environment. Also incorporating some impact exercise to provide a compression force to the bone. So not just weight which strains the bone tissue, but also compression and impact into the bone. And that was the, I guess, the major difference. It was the intensity of the resistance training, the higher weights. And what you can see is there was a much stronger response, a 4.1% improvement 
in the spine BMD and a 2.6% improvement in the hip BMD over the period of the eight months of the trial. Um, and increases in cortical bone thickness and other measures which would uh, suggest that the bone is much more robust around the hip and the spine. Uh, minimal soft tissue injuries, and this was likely put down to the highly supervised nature of the trial, which is why we try to, you know, when we're doing a neuro program at St. Leonard's, it, it's supervised closely by myself and, and by other practitioners in the future as well. Uh, and also improved functional tests, the better balance, better strength with things like sit to stand and, and walking in a, in a straight line like you're doing a sobriety test. So improved balance, which ultimately, as I said, dovetails nicely with the improved bone mineral density in that you're less likely to fall and you've got more capacity to distribute load in, a, in, the, in the case of the fall. This reduces your fracture risk. So that's the evidence behind the Nero program. And this was developed by the Bone Clinic in Queensland. Uh, which is a, a research facility that's um, also looking at performing the outcomes of their research. So, so continuing on with the trial um, exercise program to get more data and to really build up a, a, a real world um, perspective on how this, this works. But um, the key things to note, and if you think back to when we talked about medication compared to say what we're going to see here with exercise. So the average was a 4% improvement but there's been some people whose um, bone density has improved by up to 20% in the course of time, uh, 12, 12 months or so of doing this exercise. So there's got a really profound potential to cause an increase in uh, bone mineral density. And there's response rate. So even if you get a modest improvement, you, most people will respond. So 70 to 85% of people will respond to the exercise at some point and see improvements. Whereas we spoke about with medication, uh, up to 40% don't respond. So only 60% respond with medication. So superior to medication uh, based on these results. And a 90% reduction in fracture risk. So again, this higher intensity exercise, we're talking about, um, you know, not just an improvement in bone, but a vast improvement in strength and balance. And I know quite a few of my clients have, have reported, even in the short periods of time doing the exercise program, uh, at St. Leonard's, that they've noticed those changes in their strength, in their capacity to walk upstairs and do things like that. So functional improvements reduces the risk of falls and ultimately reduces the fracture risk, which is a big one, because that's the thing that's going to make a huge problem for people with osteoporosis. Um, and now, I'm sure, so two things, I, I know I'm going to preempt people's questions. I think, um, so... <laughs> A question I got asked a lot about the trial and about the you know, the actual research was, oh, was it better if people were doing the exercise and taking medication, or or was it um, did it make it no difference? And the answer to that is not easy to make because they can in the trial they controlled for um, medication use. So some people in the trial were using medication, some weren't, and. Um, but what they did is that the groups that were randomized to control and to the experimental group, uh, they, they also controlled based on medication use. Therefore, so what they tried to do is have a relatively even spread of people using medication between the groups. That was just to try and negate the impact of the medication so that it was controlled for. And then what we saw in the results was the impact of the exercise. So I guess the overarching answer is, is that we don't know for sure um, we'd, they would have to look at the individual people in the trial. And I haven't done this myself yet in, in terms of did the individual people who got the highest response also using medication? I'm not sure. But the take home message is that with or without medication, you can respond to the exercise. Uh, and so we'll get, I'll get to those questions soon. And again, the other thing that um, I often get asked is about osteostrong. <laughs> So I know there's an osteostrong uh, clinic up in Crow's Nest, uh, I believe, up on Willoughby Road. And osteostrong is another, I always I'd say, well, it's almost a competing brand here at the moment. Um, but yeah, so osteostrong is another exercise program that has had made some big claims about its potential impact on bone. Uh, so I suppose there'd be two things to say there. The, the osteostrong program is, using isometric exercise. So this is where you're just pushing on a machine at the hardest you can push, but you're not moving anywhere. So you're sitting down, pushing with your legs or pushing with your arms or um, 
trying to do similar to sort of squats and things like that, but you're not moving, you're just pr producing a force for a short period of time. Uh, it's only 10 minutes a week or something like of, of that nature. It's a, it's a short period of time. So, you know, again, you got to we raise our eyebrows if you're familiar with the science behind exercise. Generally, that's not enough time to create a response in, the, in any uh, facets of strength or, or bone, but they're making these claims. So it's worth testing. And this has been tested in the Lift More for Men trial, which is um, not, um, well, I think the results are out there now, but this trial was looking at uh, comparing a Nero, so the, the high intensity resistance training that, that we're doing at St. Leonard's and was part of the Lift More trial originally, and, and comparing that to the osteostrong exercises. And the, the overall picture was that a Nero was superior in, in all areas or most areas to osteostrong. Um, and osteostrong did not produce the same effects on cortical bone that um, a Nero produced. Um, and so, and, and interestingly enough, in this trial that for men, the, the effects of the Nero program were more modest than they were for the women. So that's something to be considered is that um, women will probably, judging from the evidence we have so far, women will respond maybe better to this type of resistance training. But uh, the other thing to take into account with the osteostrong um, uh, framework, again, I've, I've had a look at the, the study that they quote on their website as well. And it, it, the design of the study is not great. There's not, um, they don't have a control group there was only 55 participants in total and only nine of those were actually followed up with, with bone mineral density scans. So some of the conclusions they've come to, although they were uh, promising, the actual design of the study behind that um, program is, is lacking in quality and that there's things missing there with control group, with, with randomization of groups and things like that, which the, um, the Nero trial had. Anyway, just thought we'd, I'd touch on that because it's often a question I get. Um, so, a Nero at St. Leonard's Physio, uh, just to give you everyone a rundown of some of the things. Now, I know this is going to be something that especially new patients are, are interested to know more about. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Thanks, Deborah. <laughs> um, so Deborah just said it's interesting that the top line of the Austria Strong website is for franchising. So, there you go. Anyway, um, so at St. Leonard's Physio, at the moment, we're running the Nero program uh, commenced in February this year. It's two times per week. So you have to attend two times per week to get the benefits. So that's an important commitment to make. 45 to 60 minutes. And at the moment we run them up at North's, our, our clinic there in Camaray, uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That's probably going to change a little bit in the new year. So I do have to caveat that with the, with the information that things are going to change a bit next year. We're using specialized equipment. So now some of the specialized equipment we use is wooden plates, <laughs> highly technological, but um, the benefit of it is that we can really progress the weightlifting that is done from a very low level. And so often a barrier to resistance training in a gym or, or even with a, you know, maybe a personal trainer or something like that is that you don't necessarily have the equipment there. Easy to, to access this equipment by the way, but it's not necessarily readily available and therefore it's hard to sort of get started, especially if you have very low bone density, there is a risk. And so the specialized equipment that we use means that we can mitigate that risk a lot. Um, and then the high RIP program, so high intensity resistance interval training. So we tr I try to make this program as, as high intensity in that time that you're there and also enjoyable, uh, but also structured in that you're doing similar exercises in each week. So you can really perfect those exercises and then start to really increase the intensity of those exercises sufficient enough to actually load bone. But um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the exercises that we do in just a moment. Uh, but the costs there, again, things are gonna change a bit, but at the moment, $20 per class, you do have to be a member of the gym at North, so that's nineteen dollars per week. So it ends up being up to about it's close to sixty dollars per week uh, to to attend the classes, and then it's one hundred and sixty dollars for the initial assessment, which is a screening, um, medical screening, a functional assessment, and an exercise assessment that, that uh, uh, one of us performs. At the moment, it's me, but we're going to be uh, expanding our 
our um, capacity next year. So our other physiotherapist, Chris Andriano, who I'm sure some of you are very familiar with, who's fantastic physio, uh, will be getting on board and, and, and providing this service as well. Uh, we get people to pay up front so that you, you pay for a 10 week block and that's mainly to just get you committed to that 10 week block and, and, and then hopefully that will improve adherence over that 10 week block and, and just makes things easier. We're running it in four 10 week blocks in the year. So that's 40 weeks potential of attending the program. Ideally, we'll try and get that to be closer to a full year, 52 weeks, uh, because the more you can attend, the better the results. But basically twice a week uh, for eight to 12 months is the time frame that is required to really see the benefits in terms of strength, balance, and bone density, which is obviously the thing that people are most keen to see the change on. You're not gonna see any changes there for at least that time. So to come for one term is not generally sufficient. And I know that's a big commitment for people to make, but that's reality. And um, also, you know, once you've done 12 months, if you've seen the benefits, the only way to keep them going is to keep going. The exercise needs to become part of our lifestyle. It's not, it's not a medication that you just take and then it's, uh, it's done. It has to be part of a lifestyle. Um, and that's really important. So the exercise that we do, things you might've seen on TV or even done yourself in the past, um, you know, heavy weightlifting, using Olympic bars and Olympic plates, um, but obviously, as I said, using specialized equipment such that we can build up to this level, this intensity. So the deadlift is, is a fundamental part of loading the bone. And this is just a very brief snapshot, but you can see here in the Nero program, we do what's called a very stiff legged deadlift. So not the picture A. Picture B is more of a uh, standard deadlift. So it's not incorrect form there, but that's not the correct form for the Enero program. The Enero program is based around this picture A, which was a very uh, stiff-legged deadlift. And the reason being is it puts the spine at an angle to the floor such that once you lift the weight, there's quite a large force being applied along the length of your spine, uh, more so than what you see in this, um, in this uh, B, B image, in the, in, the, in the regular deadlift. So we're imparting like a tension and a compression force through the spine. As I said, things that the spine can withstand, uh, but obviously if it's, if it's really heavy, there's risk of injury. So we have to build it up over time. And this weightlifting in such a this manner is, is part of what really loads up the bone and starts to create a change, uh, an impetus to change that bone. So that's the deadlift. Then we've got the squat. So this image is a front squat where the bar is positioned on at the front of the body on the shoulders, but we ultimately try to achieve a back squat, which is where the barbell is positioned on the shoulders. Uh, and again, this is loading the spine, but it's also loading the hips quite a lot. Um, you can see in this picture, this lady, you know, her hips are quite flexed up towards her, um, towards her body. So uh, she's folding into her hips quite a lot and her knees as well. So, when we load this exercise, we start to really put force through those areas. Now, often the most challenging exercise to grasp, and particularly for women, now this is nothing to do, this isn't sexism. <laughs> this is just uh, basically, you know, our body morphology uh, is different between men and women, the, the pelvis, the hips, the length of our femur, the rotation of our femurs. There's all sorts of uh, anthropometric measures that then just mean that performing this exercise with really great form is, is much more challenging for women typically. Uh, and sometimes just physically can't do it exactly perfectly, picture perfect. So we can work around that. And there's different progressions we can do, uh, which I've listed here. It's not gonna mean a lot to you right now, but there's different versions of a squat. Um, okay, the press. This one is not so much about loading bone, as it is about building strength and in, in key areas. Obviously, another thing that women with osteoporosis often are concerned about is the rounded upper back, the sort of kyphosis of the spine. So this exercise is really targeting the muscles at the back of the shoulders and, and in the upper back uh, to try to build strength in that area and ultimately uh, prevent excessive amounts of, of 
kyphotic progression in the thoracic spine. You can't you can't stop this kyphosis from occurring 100%. Like it's part of a normal process, especially as we age. But this can help to improve that and also build strength in the arms. So we work on the press again. Often we have to modify this for people. Uh, commonly shoulder problems, wrist issues, other things going on. So the idea is that this exercise program is quite um, structured. There's specific exercises we do. We try our best to work on those exercises, but if it's not gonna work for an individual person, we can, we can change that. And then the drop chin, this is where we start to get some impact. So it's like a chin up and a jump, and then you ultimately land heavily on the ground. So you get the air by pulling up and jumping. And then you let yourself fall to the floor and you try to create impact through your body. And again, this has progressed very gradually so as not to cause injury. Um, but ultimately, if you can really tolerate high impact loads here, you're putting a great force into your bones that will stimulate them to improve as well. So those, those four, the deadlift, the squat, the press and the drop chin are the ones that were part of the study uh, that was done with the Lipmore trial. And then they form the basis of the program that we run. And then on top of all that, we do core strengthening work, uh, balance work and other things that complements that program and, and rounds out a, a good session of exercise. And that intensity builds up over time. So when you start out, I know we've got different groups running at the moment. One of our groups running uh, at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday and Thursday, uh, just starting with the program in the last uh, six weeks. So we're sort of working at a lower level in some ways, but working on technique and building the fundamentals. And then as the program progresses and the weights get heavier and things get more intense, it, the workout overall does increase. And so that's a great feeling for, for most women and men when they get to that stage. Um, all right. And so thank you very much for listening. Bang, 7.30. God. <laughs> all right. Kudos to myself. So, uh, now, I'll, first and foremost, I'll just try and get stuck into the chat box questions. So let me just um, stop the sharing of the screen there. So I'm just going to we'll leave most of you on mute for the moment. Let me just pull up the chat box and see what I can answer here. So, um, yep, yeah, so I've had some people asking me about my lumbar BMD is in osteopenia range. Uh, interested in exercises with the same. Yep. So I suppose, yeah, the question being, you know, osteopenia, osteoporosis, does the exercise differ? Uh, and so the, the, the overall answer is no. But obviously, as I said to you, the lower your bone density, the more caution we have to take um, in progressing that exercise. So it's your start point might differ. But for someone with osteopenia in the lumbar spine, uh, Again, coming on board with, with the weight bearing and, and high intensity weight bearing exercise that, um, that we can provide at St. Leonard's Physio and with the Nero program is exactly what is important. Um, and this would be a discussion we have at an, an assessment first and foremost to, to kind of find out what works best. But um, what we've described there today is, is the most evidence-based thing for improving lumbar osteopenia from regards to exercise. Um, now, so, so again, someone's asked me more specifically about, um, again, like lumbar BMD versus hip BMD. And so someone's saying, okay, well, my hip has been stable, but, um, you know, in terms of the bone mineral density, but my L3 and L1 dropped uh, last November 2019. So, um, yeah, and again, this can happen. You're not, you're not going to necessarily have the scores equivalent in all areas of the body. Typically, you know, as I said, to diagnose osteoporosis, we're looking at the hips. So if your hips are in good shape, uh, that's, a, that's a good sign that um, your general bone mineral density is, is probably uh, tracking well. But yes, the spine will often show uh, some low, low bone mineral density results there. And again, the best things that you're going to be doing for that is going to be the things that we've described here in this program. So walking, yoga, Pilates, all fantastic exercises in their own right. But unfortunately, none of them of a sufficient intensity to really load bone. There's no evidence to show that those exercise types, yoga, Pilates, walking, are going to load the bone. It's really going to be this high intensity resistance training uh, and impact work that's going to do uh, 
the most effect. Um, yeah, so I covered those ones. Again, uh, so uh, in terms of nutrition, it's not my area of expertise, but um, general the general uh, ideas there is that vitamin D and calcium levels should be checked with a, with a blood test and then that can be then addressed either through diet changes. And again, that would be something that would be a nutritionist would be more well placed to advise on what exact diet changes to make uh, or supplements, vitamin D and calcium supplements uh, are, are common. Um, can you overdose with vitamin D? Yes, I would say you probably, there's probably high levels that um, can cause some issues, but I don't know the exact evidence on that. Um, statins causing weak musculature. Yeah, again, like the side effects of a lot of drugs can, so either osteoporotic intervention drugs, um, but bisphosphonates, things like that, can all have side effects on the body. Um, and then, yes, you can have the side effects, things like statins or, you know, as I said, um, corticosteroids, other forms of medication can have side effects that will then have subsequent effects on bone. And if you're losing muscular strength and losing physical capacity to exercise, this can in indirectly affect your bone in that you're exercising less. Um, so yeah, that's definitely relevant. Um, so again, uh, Annette asked what happens after the program is completed? So as I said, I, I sort of touched on this. It's a million dollar question, isn't it? So if you do 10 weeks to start off, uh, that's great. But unfortunately at that stage, you will not have done enough to really cause a, a true improvement in, in all the areas that you want to. So then the key is to continue with the program. And I've had this discussion with a lot of people recently that I've been seeing for one-on-one -on -one assessments. This may take a different form for every individual. So each person's gonna have a, either more of an aptitude for exercise. So maybe they're safe enough and confident enough to go and do this exercise themselves. Um, in which case, that's great. It's not necessarily recommended, at least not unless you've done a year's worth of exercise, because the the, what, the rate of progressing exercise um, and the heavy the weights you need to be lifting everything is very much a complicated process, and it's not something that you can necessarily do independently safely, especially if you have very low bone density or or other chronic health conditions uh, that might be impacted, like lower back pain, chronic lower back pain, disc injuries and things like that. So as I said, I think everyone should look at the idea of when you're starting up an exercise program, you need to be committing to eight to 12 months. And then after that, it'll be a discussion of what's best for that person and, and what people are happy to do to, to maintain the benefits. Um, okay. Uh, Christina Montserrat asks, are there age indications for a Nero, so not really. Like I think what you mean there is, are there minimum or maximum ages or, or sort of age ranges that you should be doing? The the the, the evidence is based on postmenopausal women over the age of fifty eight. So you put it that way is that that was the study, that was the population of people that were studied. Um, so the evidence is telling that that's the age range that responded to the exercise, but we can elaborate these results a little bit and say that a Nero would be beneficial for all ages. You know, even, even younger people will get a benefit from this in the sense that they're going to be building bone and building muscle strength and building physical function. But there's no age limits. Each person who comes to see me about this program would, would be just based on not so much age, but on physical function and your diagnoses and what's safe for you to be doing. Um, all the people like, you know, we've got, I've got, you know, I've got all ages in the class. So we've got women over the age of 70 and all levels of capacity. And, you know, they love it, I think. <laughs> but I think yeah, that, you know, that it's, it, we can make it work. Um, so that's good. The heel drops stress the knee a lot. Yes, not a lot. I wouldn't, a lot's really strong, but the heel drops and impact exercises uh, do stress the knees and the hips and the joint tissue. And this is something that we need to consider. So if you're someone who has osteoarthritis in conjunction with your osteopenia osteoporosis, uh, especially of the knees and, and of the hips, then we do have to 
consider that in the exercise we're doing. And again, it, it's a case of starting small and building it up. Um, but the heel drops do stress the knee. And so, and then the, the drop chins as well. So we have to um, try to build that up gradually. Okay. I think that was, from, that was from Frank. So I think if that's Frank, I think it is. How are you going, mate? <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. Um, now, um, we've got Neil. So what is a hack squat? So a hack squat is the using the hack squat machine in the gym. Uh, and that is basically keeping your back more upright and vertical. So I'm not sure if people are very familiar with a hack squat and what it looks like, but it's essentially targeting the quads and the, and the thigh muscles and the knees more because there's less fold of the hip. So your back is much more upright and the machine allows you to perform that movement. Whereas uh, you can't really perform a hack squat um, in, you know, in free space because you would likely fall backwards. Um, okay. Thanks, thanks. Everyone's saying thank you. I appreciate that. Um, as I said, it's been recorded. Uh, we're just going through these. There's lots here. Um, existing arthritis in the back and legs. Yeah, yeah. Existing arthritis in the back and legs um, is not a contraindication to the program, but it's something that we need to consider. Uh, so again, this is where a one-on-one -on -one assessment comes in so that we can devise the best plan. If you have arthritis in your back and your legs, it does not mean you cannot do this program. But I would encourage you to come along if, um, if you've been diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis. Uh, the classes times, again, probably not worth talking about at the moment because we're in the middle of a term, we're going to be starting a new term and um, then times will probably change. But the times, I always try to make the times of the classes try to suit everybody as much as possible. And often that means mornings and afternoons and possibly after work hours as well, or before work hours. Um, and so this is a fantastic, Deborah Curry has written something very nice. Um, completed, Angus, you'll never Seriously though, just contemplating it, doing it with others. There's hands down with Help me stick to it. I'm just gonna mute all that. Um, it's helped me stick to it and I would have dropped off if it was trying to make the lifestyle change on my own. That's a very lovely sentiment from Deborah, and um, I guess that sort of speak, speaks to why the commitment to the program is so important um, because it's, it's not easy to do these exercises all the time and it's not easy to do the types of exercises that we're doing. Um, and so having the support of not just myself as a practitioner and whoever's helping you, but the other members of the group uh, means that it's an enjoyable experience for everybody. And, I'm trying to, you know, and I hope that people can build some social uh, relationships from the classes as well. Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, do weightlifting sportsmen have stronger bone densities? <laughs> Frank, oh, love it. Um, do weight, yeah, so the question was, do weightlifting sportsmen have stronger bone densities? Well, I don't know if there's evidence out there to suggest if they do or not, but it would be intuitive to consider that they do. Uh, just given the intensity of the weight that they're lifting on a regular basis, they probably have higher bone density. I know we're, we're going over time, guys, so if you have to leave, uh, it's more than uh, fine. Um, and that's, thank you there. Okay, I've got through all the questions in the chat. Uh, I'll just put this on gallery view. Um, so if there's any more questions, throw them in the chat, or you could probably, I think you can unmute yourselves. So if you want to, holler out to me uh, and go off mute, that's fine as well. Otherwise, um, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. As I said, this has been recorded, so you can access it again if wanted or friends can access it. And um, if you do want any more information, obviously contact the clinic, 94381782 is the number, um, and the email address, inquiries at stateliminsphysio.com.au. Um, and then we can, we can direct your inquiry wherever it needs to go. Thank you. Cheers. Many Have a great you. night.